How much research you need to do to match into residency in the US? Hello everyone, this is Malki Asad, the plastic surgery resident in the US, and I did three years of research, one at the Mayo Clinic and two at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, before matching into residency. And in this video, I'm gonna go over how much research you need to do in terms of publications, presentations, to match into residency in the US. And to do that, we're gonna use the most accurate data regarding the outcome, which is the NRMP data, the data from the organization that runs the match. And I'll be using the charting outcomes for IMGs and for USMD seniors who are fourth year medical students applying to residency. So the majority of US medical students from allopathic medical school. And you can get these PDFs from the NRMP website and I'll leave the links for these PDFs in the description of this video. So where do you find the data regarding research? If you go to table two on page six of the IMG file, you will find here the mean number six, the mean number of abstracts, comma presentations and publications. And you can see here for the overall specialties, this is not for a specific specialty, this is for all specialties. For US IMGs, you have divided in those who matched and those who did not match. And for non-US IMGs, you have it divided into also those who matched and those who did not match. And you can see that the mean number of abstracts, presentations, publications is four for those who matched. And it's interesting enough, it's higher for those who did not match. But for non-US IMGs, it's higher for those who matched. It's 8.3 and those who did not match is 7.3. For US MD seniors or US medical students, you can see here mean number of abstracts, presentations and publications. It's 10 for those who matched and 11 for those who did not match. So some people reviewing this data might say, well, you know, the number is lower for those who matched. So in that case, maybe publications are hurting my application, not helping my applications because those who did not match have a higher score and they still did not match. And the same applies here for US IMGs, but there are multiple things to take into consideration here that might be biasing these results. First, one thing to keep in mind when looking at this data this is a combination of things. This is not just publications, which some people think, oh, I need to get four publications or six publications. No, this is the mean number of abstracts come up presentations come up publications, which means if you have one publication and three presentations and three abstracts, that means you get number seven here because it's a collection of all of them. So, or you might have zero publications, but you have five presentations and this number will be five here. And we all know that getting a publication is much, much harder than getting a presentation or an abstract. Some people have a presentation at the research day in their school or a local meeting in which the bar to get in is much lower than a national meeting or international meeting. So this number does not actually reflect the real output of people's research. Although, you know, it gives us an idea, but it's not accurate because it lumps three categories together and these three categories are not actually the same level of uh, appreciation from program directors and the same level of difficulty to get. Another thing that might be biasing the results is the other factors as associated with your application. So somebody who's old graduate who failed step one and maybe step two and then ended up passing them, they usually tend, especially for not competitive specialties, they usually tend to go and do some research to build a competitive application or like a more competitive application, kind of compensate for the low scores or the attempts or the gap in your education. So they use it as a way to build connections and with that they get publications. So one thing that might be biasing these results is that these applicants that have more research inherently, like they usually are not as competitive as the applicants with no research because the applicants with no research might think, oh, I didn't need the research to start with. But that doesn't mean that research is not helpful. I'm someone who always advocates for research, especially if you have time to do it, because not only it reflects me number of abstracts and presentation and publication, but because you build amazing connections with US mentors in the US, these US mentors advocate for you. They get you uh, maybe US clinical experiences. They write LORs for you. They know people, they might call people on your behalf. So the benefit of research goes way beyond just this category here, number six, that might not really reflect the full picture here. And for those who are interested in 
looking for a research position, which I highly recommend, especially in the time period between September and March, because you don't have much to do. You know, you're waiting for interviews. So just preparing for interviews is not really a reason to do nothing. So this is a great time to build research and build connections and even build your connections for your fellowship time. Because now you're doing research with cardiology, for example, if you're interested in cardiology, uh, even though you're applying to IM now, these connections in cardiology will help you when you apply to fellowship. So I highly recommend it if you are interested in learning more on how to find a position because it's easy. You know, you send emails, right? This is what everyone talks about. But there are a lot of nuances that comes into picking the right mentor. What is the email template, the CV template, how to prepare for interviews, how to pick a mentor uh, that we discuss in that course. And, you know, it's risk free. So if you don't like it, you get your money back. Uh, no questions asked. And if you want to learn how to do research, we also have amazing courses for you. During my research time, I published over 160 papers and I try to summarize all that experience for you in those courses. So you don't have to suffer and, you know, try to learn from different people. Everything is summarized, practical, useful information for you in one place that teaches you how to do research, how to do statistics, uh, how to do systematic review. And again, if you don't like these courses, we'll give you your money back. It's fully risk-free because my priority is that you succeed and you learn. And if you don't think that it's helpful to you, no problem, we'll give you your money back. And you can find the links for all these courses in the description of this video. Another thing that might reflect your research experience or what kind of things you need to do is this mean number of research experiences. And you can see 2.1 for US IMGs who match, 2.8 for non-US IMGs and for uh, US and the seniors is 3.7. Personally, I don't think this number matters. I think it doesn't mean anything. You might have six research experiences. Each one is one month and you have no publications from that. Well, somebody might have one research experience at MD Anderson like me. I spent two years there and I published almost 60 papers from there and it's one. So I don't think the number of research experiences matter. Uh, is, is what you're getting out of this experience and what you've done during that experience. So don't worry too much. Oh, I don't. I only have like one research experience. Don't try to make up things or divide the same place with like, oh, I worked with mentor A, that's research experience number one. I worked with mentor B, that's research experience number two. I don't recommend that. I recommend if you did research in one place, especially if it's the same field of research, consider it as one well research experience and the output of that research is what matters. Also, don't worry too much about the mean number of abstracts, presentations, publications. It's nice to have more, but also focus on quality. Don't just publish 20 case reports and you have no real papers or 20 collaborator paper and you don't have actual first author paper. Uh, also, first authorship is very important. We talk about all that during the research course. And by the way, if you want to Check out how the, the ERS is filled, how your ERS CV is filled, especially the publication section. Check out my, my, my video about that because it can show you how things are filled on that end. So even if you're not applying this year, it's important to see how it gets filled so you know how to prepare for that. And I'll leave the link for that video in the description below. And now let's go over the certain specialties. We'll go over IM, FM, uh, some surgical campaign specialties to see kind of the trends of the uh, specialty number six, mean number of abstracts, presentations, and publications. Before we go to each specialty, I want to show you chart nine, which summarizes the research outputs for US IMGs, non-US IMGs, for those who match and did not match. And here you can see that mean average number they have for abstracts, presentations, and publications. And you can see after 16, it doesn't go higher because they have it max at 16. So these 32, 22, it's just max. You can't see how high it goes. So this graph will not reflect the full picture to you because in orthopedic surgery here, for example, you can see 100 versus 38, but these are exactly the same because they're over 16. Although there is a huge difference, almost like triple the number of the research output for those who matched. That's why we need to go into each specialty to have a look at the granular data regarding this outcome. And let's start with orthopedic surgery with US IMGs. If you look here at number six, it's slightly higher for those who match compared to those who did not match 30 versus 27. But for non-US IMGs, it's 100 versus 38, almost triple, but the sample size is one. So this is not really accurate because it's only one person. So I'm not sure if this person was just a superstar. If we have two or three people who match, things would have been different. What will probably give us a better idea is the USMD seniors because the sample size is bigger. So you can see here the mean 
is 23.8 versus 18 for those who did not match. So slightly higher, but again, not a huge difference. Neurosurgery, another competitive specialty. You can see the, the uh, mean is higher for those who match from US IMGs and non-US IMGs. And here you can see a big difference now for non-US IMGs. It's 87.8, so like almost 88 versus 51. And we have a good sample size. It's not one like ortho. So that can show you that, for especially for competitive specialties, having more output, although this number is not super accurate, usually translate into longer time or, or means that you spent longer time doing research, you were working harder, and that translates into big, uh, you know, stronger relationships, more impressive application, you're able to impress people more and translate into matching. But again, the, the number doesn't really reflect the full picture because it's a lot of factors into play. And you can see that there are people who did not match, 26 of them, with an average of 51. So these people spent a lot of time doing research. So we always hear the success stories, probably these 14 people that matched, but there are people who worked really hard and they published a lot of research and they still did not match because there are other factors that play a role. And if you want to talk to advisors, we have phenomenal advisors in neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, OBGYN, almost all the specialties that you can see on this list, we have advisors for that from both IMGs and US students. So whatever type of applicant you are, we have the right fit for you to help you with not only the advice, but the personal statement, CV, how to interview for residency, and I'll leave the link for these services in the description below. The best thing to get is the match package, which uh, combines all these services together and gives you a discounted rate for that. But feel free to talk to our customer support team for free. They can advise you on what best service to move forward with your application. And we're happy to help you. Our services are 100% satisfaction guarantee, which means if you're not happy, we give you your money back, no questions asked, because our goal is for you to succeed and be happy with the service we're providing you. Let's look at neurosurgery for USMD seniors. And you can see it's also higher for those who match, 37.4 versus 31.8. So you can see that even for neurosurgery, even US students, they've published a lot of research, uh, most likely in neurosurgery and still did not match. So research helps, having more research helps, but there are still people who worked hard, published a lot, and still did not match. Let's look at plastic surgery for US IMGs. Interestingly, those who matched had much lower mean compared to those who did not match. Seven versus 23. This is a very low number for plastic surgery because you'll see the other numbers. This is very low, but again, small sample size. There is a lot of potential for bias. But you can see this is more reflective as we have a more representative sample size uh, you have 55.7. That's very high for mean, even for mean combination of abstract presentations and publications. And the unmatched 37 is still high, but not as big as 55. Let's look at US medical students. You have 34.7. So 34.7 versus 26.3 for unmatched applicants in plastic surgery. Dermatology, another uh, heavy uh, field for on research and very competitive specialty. You can see number six is 28 uh, versus seven. So you can see that research is important for, you know, competitive specialties because not only the research that you produce, but the relationship, the connections and all the other things that come with it. And you can see that's reflected here too. The mean for those who match into derm as US students is higher than those who did not match. Let's look at general surgery, 8.3 versus 8.5. So very similar, but for non-US IMGs, it's much higher, it's almost double, 22 versus 11. For US students, this mean number is still higher for uh, those who match, 10.9, so 11 versus seven, but it's not as high as neurosurgery, plastic surgery, and orthopedic surgery. Now let's look at internal medicine, a very popular specialty for IMGs. And a lot of people ask me, do I need to do research if I want to apply to internal medicine? So let's look a little bit at, at the data and then we, I can give you my advice on that. It's 3.6 versus 4.7, so higher for those who did not match. And on the other hand, for non-US IMGs, it's higher for those who matched. Uh, let's look at US students. The It's 8.7, so almost 9, versus 6.2 for those who did not match. So higher for those who matched. So that doesn't mean if I'm a US IMG, I don't re need research, but if I'm a non-US IMG, I need research. It's not like that. It's things that might bias the results, so the applicants here might be different, but generally having research helps. Uh, so I highly recommend if you have the time, especially after you submit your ERAS, there is that time period that you're interviewing. So you can definitely start a research position, start a research projects, preferably in the US, 
because they then you can get the most advantage out of your research time. So I highly recommend it if even if you're applying for internal medicine because it's correct that internal medicine is not as competitive as plastic surgery or neurosurgery, but still there are competitive programs within internal medicine. So yes, you know it's not as competitive, but there are very very good programs that you need some research to match, especially good university programs that have good match rate. This research that you're doing will help you in your fellowship application. So that's why I highly recommend doing research. Even if you're applying for internal medicine, you don't need to do as long of research time as plastic surgery and neurosurgery. For those specialties, you might need to do two, three, or four years of research. For internal medicine, I don't think you need that. Maybe like six months, a year, that definitely helps. If you have red flags on your application, you might need to extend that. But just things to keep in mind. Every applicant is different. That's why we have this residency advising sessions in which we provide one-on-one -on -one service to people and we understand their situation. I'm trying to give general advice here, but I can't advise on an individual uh, situation unless I hear your story and what the problem is. So I can give you the best advice about that. But in general, I highly recommend you do research even for internal medicine because you can match at the more competitive programs at better programs especially those academic, if you're interested in a fellowship, academic medicine, being you know in academia, that really helps. And let's finally look at family medicine. You can see here 2.7 versus 6.2. So much higher for those who did not match. And the same here, 4.5 for those who did not match. Again, doesn't really mean that you need to not do research to match, but there might be differences in the type of applicants deciding to do research because of their weak application. Now let's look at those for the U.S. students because that usually reflect more the perception of research in the field because if it's important for U.S. students, it should be important for, for IMGs. It's not like only one type of applicants need to do research. And you can see here, those who match have a higher mean than those who did not match. And you can go through each specialty. I highly recommend you check these data out and I'll leave the links for these PDFs so you can navigate that. So check the uh, data for each specialty, but again, interpret it with a grain of salt because of the, all the biases I said that might come with this specific factor of the NRMP charting outcomes data. And as I mentioned, if you're interested in learning about research, I highly, highly recommend you start as soon as you can. It's transformative. It teaches you a lot uh, how to think about papers, how to think about evidence for your patients. So even if you decide to not do research, it helps you understand evidence-based medicine more and practice the best practices for your patient. So make sure to check out the research course that I have for you. It's fully for beginners, so it's not complicated at all. If you don't like it, we'll give you your money back. We have statistics course, systematic review course, and a course on how to find research positions in the US. If you need help navigating any of our services, like, oh, I don't know what, where to start, don't hesitate to do a free consultation with our support team. It's fully free. We don't give you advice during that session. We help navigate you towards what best service would be suited for your specific needs. So you can go ahead on our website, thematchguide.com, schedule a free consultation if you need any help uh, or if there is anything we can help you with. I wish you best of luck. I hope this video is helpful to you in navigating how many publications you need to match. Unfortunately, there is no magic number because there is a lot of factors that go into matching into residency in the US, especially for competitive specialties. Again, best of luck. Make sure to check out the video I recorded on how to write a case report that I'll leave the link for that somewhere on the screen here. So make sure to check that out. Uh, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in and good luck on your match.